Hello everyone and welcome to our second episode of Tokyo Gold. My name is Matt Pointer and joining me today are three of our Olympic cycling team. We've got Carly McCulloch, Luke Plapp and Lauren Reynolds. Hi everyone. Hi. Hi. How are you going? Lauren, you're all the way over in San Diego to us people over here in Australia. Now you come from Bunbury in Western Australia, the greatest state in the country because that's where I'm from as well. But what are the differences between living in Bunbury 200 and something kilometers out of Perth and San Diego. Yeah, I mean, there is a lot, there's a lot of differences from a small town like Bunbury to San Diego where there's five lanes wide on the freeway, but it still does feel somewhat like home. I've lived here for uh, coming on 10 years now. Um, oh, wow. You know, it's on the West Coast, so just like home. Um, so there's, there's a lot of similarities. So it's, yeah, definitely feels like home here now. Fantastic. Now, Luke. You're in Brisbane at the moment in the final preparations. How's Brisbane treating you at the moment? Yeah, when we first got here, it was sunny, but the last few days it's been raining. So I don't know what everyone's on about as the sunny sunny state. Um, but no, it's not too bad up here. We're on a few day break at the moment um, before we rip into the last couple of weeks of training. So we're just refreshing and getting quick again, as Carly would say. Just the more you rest, the quicker you get, which us enduros aren't really used to. <laughs> Well, enduros don't worry about the rain when you go training, do you? Not even track enduros worry about that, though, do they? Uh, yeah, I had to do two hours yesterday and got absolutely poured on for it, so not sure what that was about. <laughs> now, Carly, the last time I saw you was the last time I flew on a plane. St George Centennial dinner, sitting at the table with you and your family uh, and Phil Bates and had a lovely time, uh, but then the plane stopped flying for people like me, so... <laughs> What's happened since March 2020? Yeah, that gosh, that is a long time ago, isn't it? Um, it is. So, yeah, I mean, obviously the postponement of the games, the whole COVID situation, the lack of flying. Um, but, yeah, I'm really excited now to be what we're like 23 days away from the Olympics starting. So um, I'm up here in Brisbane with Luke and, um, yeah, just uh, yeah, preparing to go fast. So looking forward to, to the games and what's upcoming. Now, Lauren and Carly, you both went to the Olympic Games starting off in 2012, then you were both there in 2016, but Carly, you were there as a reserve. 2020 now becomes 2021. Give, me some, give us an idea of some of the changes that have happened for you both in that period of your careers. Yeah, well, I mean, I guess I'll start. Um, it's now going to be nine years in between um, competing for me, which, um, you know, it feels like yesterday, but it also feels like a really long time. So um, I'm super excited to have been officially selected for Tokyo and um, taking my experience over the last 10 years into this to this Games. And, you know, I remember London, I was, um, you know, that baby-faced um, freshman like Luke is this time around. And uh, I learned a lot at those Games that I think will hold me in good stead for these Games. And even being in Rio and watching everyone else compete, even though I was, you know, desperate to be out there myself, um, it just feels fantastic to, to know I'm going to compete this time. And yeah, I hope that everything that I've learned over the last 10 years is going to hold me in a good place. And I'm pretty sure Lauren can probably attest to that. Um, the experience goes a long way when you're talking about elite sport and, and going for those gold medals. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, I, I didn't realise it was 10 years. I Now that you say that, though, I do remember you in London. So, um, I mean, five years, what's it? Yeah, five years now feels like forever, but yet it doesn't. So I can only imagine 10 years. And for me personally, um, I've changed coaches within the five years. I went off the national program, um, cut, the, cut the scholarship and kind of not... Um, was told straight up that it won't, you know, I won't be going to Tokyo and I won't be back on the national team. And then I am back on the national team and I am going to Tokyo. So I've been through, um, yeah, my whole five years from uh, Rio to today has, it's been, a lot has happened and, but I wouldn't change a thing for the world. Uh, it's, yeah, it's all been for the better. I've changed coaches. I set up kind of home base somewhat over here, um, but just, yeah, coming into my third Olympics, I feel very at ease um, and just, yeah, the whole, the calmness of it, I feel uh, very attached to. And um, I think even though it's it's a different games and there's no spectators and it'll be, you know, um, 
I'm sure it's all just going to feel very different. I think being here in the U.S. where it's been crazy, um, I feel kind of prepared for it. Like, um, I actually feel like I'm more ready for this one than I ever have been because of all the different factors. Um, and, uh, I mean, it's, it kind of sounds crazy, but just knowing that there's not actually going to be many fans and things like that actually brings some comfort to me just from <laughs> how I am over here and, uh, you know, not having that big stage, and I've done that before. So if that makes sense, I kind of feel, yeah, a lot has changed, but I feel more ready than ever this time around, even with all the, like, unknowns and the, the crazy times. So, um, I mean, hopefully it pays off, but... Um, yeah, it's five years has come up quick. <laughs> I'll come back to both of you with a couple of things you both brought up then, but I'll, I'll jump in and speak to Luke so he doesn't feel left out here. Mate, uh, we go back to 2019, Brisbane World Cup, where you suddenly got thrown up into the team in the semi-final. Um, for those cyclists in the world, riding a few points lower in your gear ratio because you were the young kid in the team and you excelled there. Now... I'm going to go out on a limb here. The extra 12 months hasn't hurt you, has it, in this development of the team? No, definitely not. Um, I think for me it's been quite lucky. Like you said, I've been had to build a bit more strength and ride a bigger gear now. Um, and I think we've even seen since then the times have dropped a lot. Like we were, I think we were 0.2 off the world record in Brisbane in 2019 yeah. and now that world record's four seconds quicker. So I'm lucky that I've had the, the last 12 months to be able to ride a bigger gear, get a bit stronger, and I'm really looking forward to to being able to add a bit more to the team now, I guess. For sure, for sure. Um, Lauren, I've got to ask you this question because it intrigues me. You're at the top of your game, you're in the national team, and then you get told, sorry, you've got no scholarship left. Now, that tells me, and, that, and now here we are sitting, talking to you before you go to your third Olympics. It clearly states there's a lot of resilience in there and determination, but what does that do to an athlete um, when they get told, sorry, that's it, you're done? Yeah. Um, I mean, that phone call was was tough. Um, it, I, I got it just weeks after the World Championships of the year in 2017. I had was in the, the main event, which is um, a fairly big ask in our sport, and then a couple of weeks prior to that, I, was, I had got a bronze at a World Cup. So it wasn't a, my worst year, but yeah, it was, that was tough. And it definitely, I mean, it ripped me apart. Like I went, I, all the layers come off. I went, I felt like I went back to rock bottom for sure. Um, with all like areas of life, um, sporting just being, you know, my everything, but everything else was kind of unfolding as well. Um, so I felt like it came all at once, but it did. I mean, I felt like it had to happen and it had to, all the layers had to kind of rip off to, to just realize what I what I needed to do, who I needed around me, and what it was going to take. I always knew I had it in me to fight. Like I, I feel like I'm a hard worker. I kind of I won't quit easy. Um, it's just come from being an athlete for I've been racing for 21 years, so it's it's all I know. And so to if I was to walk away after that phone call, it, it wasn't even an option. But it was just about about how I was going to rebuild and who I was going to rebuild with. Um, and I just, I'm so grateful. I have really awesome people around me. I have a very small circle. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, just kind of had to sit down and rebuild from that. And it just, it took a lot of work. At, I mean, the amount of tears, you know, messy phone calls and just like not really knowing what was next and where to go. But I just, year by year, I kind of chipped away and it, it, for two years, it felt like I was going nowhere, making no progress and just blowing all my money. Um, but it, you know, I had a plan and it was always the plan. It was a three year plan that I kind of set out with my coach just a couple of weeks after that phone call. And it was all, you know, it's a private coach. It was nothing to do with the program, obviously. Um, but I just, I trusted him. He trusted me and we just stuck to the plan. And it was, it was a long plan. It's now four years, really. It was three years initially, but still to this day, you know, we work very hard every single day and it was just, it paid off and. Because of that, I feel like I'm in a really good position now where um, I, I just have that feeling I can handle anything or I can take on anything in any circumstances. Um, so to get the phone call when I did um, from the same person who initially called me to cut the contract to say, hey, congrats, you're going to the Olympics, um, 
or going to Tokyo, which was, you know, word for word, you're not going to Tokyo, so <laughs> way out. Um, it was it was a very, yeah, it was a special day. Um, and I hold, I don't hold any grudges. I'm not going to, like, I'm not sour about it. I, it makes me even happier. And I feel, um, you know, I just feel ready and excited to, I've been through that and now let's go. And if you want to continue to back me, you know, you're on my team. I welcome you. Let's go. So. <laughs> I'm on your team, Lauren. The- the whole of Australia is going to be backing you, that's for sure. Um, I spoke to Matt Glatzer, Rowan Dennison and Natalia Deem in the first of our Tokyo talks. And right at the end of it, um, I asked them about goals and so forth. I'm not going to really ask about goals just yet, but one of the things Matt Glatzer said is he'd love to go to one of these championships and have the opportunity to really enjoy it without that. You know, that, that pressure of crossing the line first to actually be in involvement because you're going to a you're all going to a magnificent thing. Like this is just huge, the Olympic Games. But you do have that sort of that that pressure you put on yourselves, that sort of the refrigerator sitting on your shoulders all week long because you want to do the best you can. Going to your third Olympics, Carly, Lauren, are you able to go to this one with a little bit more enjoyment of the idea of it? Or is the pressure no different to 2007 Junior Worlds, Carly, when you got your first medal? Oh, look, I think um, one of the things I tell younger athletes is that the nerves never change. You just become way, way, way better at being able to manage and handle them. But I'm as nervous lining up for an Olympic gold medal final as what I am for a, you know, a national championship bronze medal, whatever it might be, because you, you invest so much and you put so much in it and you love the sport so much that you just want to do the best that you can. But I completely empathise with Maddie's um, Maddie's comment, and it's something that he and I talk about a lot because for the both of us, there's always been a fair bit of pressure. And I think what I've come to realise over the last couple of years is that you know everybody wants the same thing, right? Nobody goes to the Olympics to come second. So, uh, and and winning is really really hard. And most people walk away from the Olympics, you know, if you want to, for want of a better word, as losers. But so then I had to sort of think to myself, well, what, what, is it, what is it about the Olympics? It's actually about going there and doing the best that you can. And so I think that I can find a lot of enjoyment out of going out there on the track in Tokyo and maximising my potential in every area. And that's what I've worked on with my team over the last four or five years in particular. But it's, it's a collective 15 years of experience. And, um, you know, if that culminates in a gold medal, I'll tell you what, I'll be pretty happy. But if it, if it culminates in a you know, a minor final, you can bet your bottom dollar I've done the best that I can. And, you know, I hope I make Australia proud and, and everyone else proud. And I hope I can walk off the track with a big smile on my face. I have no doubt you're going to walk off the track with a big smile on your face, regardless of what happens. And I do expect to see you on that podium somewhere <laughs> in the mix, considering your history of standing on podiums at major events and world championships. Luke Platt, we talk about pressure all the time. 1984, the team's pursuit did the job and got the gold medal. Then uh, we had to wait until Athens for the next one. Is that not lost on you guys, considering you've been world record holders, you've won some very close calls, the team, in the last several years, and now you're part of that mix um, with Alex and Lee, Sam and uh, Kel. Uh, Five of you going for four spots, and I know you're all very good mates, but um, where are you in that five? We won't tell them. Where do you think you are in that five? Oh, look at the moment. I'm still probably uh, sitting in that fifth spot. It's it's so hard to tell. And I think with us in the training block we are now, it's almost you got to wait till you really freshen up and get to a couple of days out before you really know where you do sit. Um, everyone adapts so differently to the training. So we really don't know to the end. Um, but like you said, yeah, it's been quite close the last few years. Um, and we've I guess we've been the ones that have been hunted the last few years as a team. Um, but for the last 12, 18 months, we've been the hunters. And I think we're actually really happy in that position. Um, the pressure's almost off us from the outside, but we, we still believe that we're the best in the world and that we can win that goal. And I think it's been really nice that we have had that sort of, I guess, kick up the arse to, to want it more and to prove everyone wrong that what happened in Berlin uh, 18 months ago was, was wrong and it wasn't a reflection of us as a team. Um, and yeah, I really think there's a lot of confidence in this group and what we have done in training. And I think the next four weeks will really show that for ourselves. And we, 
put some good times down in trials before we head over to the games. But yeah, like you said, I'm probably not in the four at the moment, but we won't know that to the end. But either way, I know the four that we put on the track, whoever that is, whether I'm in that or not, I really do think that, that we've got the capabilities to probably break that world record because that's what you're going to need to to win the gold medal. Absolutely. It's been uh, a solid 18 months for all the trackies uh, to, since you've raced at international competition. How's the competition been for you, Lauren, racing in America? Um, like we, We've seen America go haywire over the last 18 months from, for a number of different reasons. Uh, but how has that gone for your competition side of things? Yeah, um, I'll just touch real quick on what you guys just said with the not matching up for, what was it, 18 months? You guys haven't raced? Yeah. yeah. So yeah. I, I guess like a question because I have a little bit of response to it. Like do you guys um, enjoy that of like not being able to, you kind of just have you and your teammates and your coaches to train and like compare yourself to you and not be judged of them sort of so you don't really know, are you going blind? Is that like a good thing or a bad thing for your, your guys' racing? It's a great question, by I the way. I think, um, well, I, I don't want to speak for you, Luke, but your your events, your main event with the Teams Pursuit is quite, um, you know, it's against the clock. So I guess it, maybe it's mm. less important for the racing, but definitely for the bunch events and, you know, for the Kieran that I'm targeting, I do feel a little bit like I'm going in blind because I haven't, I don't know where anybody else is going to be at. So, um, yeah, yeah. I, it's not necessarily a bad thing, but I think... Um, yeah, it's, it's literally, it's an unknown, like you said before. Who knows what people are going to bring to these games? Yeah. So, yeah, no, just to answer your question, Matt, as well, like I've had racing, um, we pretty much started back up in January. Oh, my, I'm so sorry. Hang on one second. <laughs> <laughs> this is the beauty of what we do in the world these days, isn't it? Everyone can just talk all I'm day sorry. long, but the dog, if the dog wants out, the dog needs out. He doesn't That's need it. out. Um, uh, so we started back in January and I've raced pretty much once a month um, and it's just kind of been a slow build. So it's, yeah, it's kind of been perfect with, for where we are with racing uh, in Tokyo this summer. Um, but in terms of uh, like last year, we pretty much didn't race at all. Um, but it was, I thought that was actually really good for maybe me personally um, of how I kind of handled the race situation. And because I, 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 you know, you gauge yourself off. The other competitors so for me to not go and know where I'm at and like get on the gate and you know if you get flogged you get flogged and your confidence is knocked and shit you gotta go back to the drawing board or you know you kind of have to still work on it but it's just a, a reminder so to not have any reminders of like oh you get touched up here and there and like you get you know <laughs> um, all I did was compare myself to me for the last 18 months and um, you know just like day in day out just a little bit better every four weeks and you know, and so to not have any, to go in blind and to not know, I know where I'm at because I have my training partner, but I know where I'm at because of my own like day to day training. So um, I actually thought that was the best thing ever because I had that time to not worry about traveling and getting, you know, competition stress. And then, um, yeah, there's no chance of getting my confidence knocked or anything like that. And so I gained so much confidence out of it. I've just been out of, put in the work that I needed to build up strength and all my speed stuff, um, you know, just all the, the areas of training. And so now, um, you know, I, I compare myself to my training partner who's the world champ, but also we have numbers and times, you know, across the board. And um, it's just given me a whole nother level of confidence. And so essentially we're going in blind as well because I haven't done any international racing this year. But... Um, yeah, I've actually really enjoyed it to not have that race stress. And I do find the pressure and I find those nerves like just in every day. So every every day when I get onto the, the mm. hill and we do gate starts, I feel like I get butterflies and I get a little jittery because I have times I want to beat. And so I just find that pressure, I guess, day to day. Um, but yeah, that's... Can, uh, can I ask Lauren... Um, in sprinting, we have a saying that racing makes you slow because you obviously have to travel and you have to somewhat taper off so that you can go in and be competitive. So I wonder if it's some, somewhat similar because like you, I've, I've enjoyed the long prep because 
you can really like knuckle into the the long strength base and then totally. you know all of the things that build a big base so yeah. I'm curious to know do you have the same sort of saying that racing makes you slow yeah yes and no like um I think when you're in race season and we like we sort of do all that work and then we're racing you kind of I'll get I'll get faster and faster but at the same time if you don't get the time to do the work yes it will make you slow a hundred percent it's so. it's quite interesting because how you both say like the racing makes you slow whether for us enduros it's like the only thing we want to do I think yeah. For us on the track team, like we haven't had any track racing, but we've been so lucky to have a full road season for the last 12 months. Um, and if we didn't have that, I really think we'd all be lost. It's almost been like it's a way that we can get that racing in um, and keep ticking off those little goals. I know we always talk about at the track how you sprinters, like you're not racing much at all and we don't know how we'd be able to cope without it. And it's the same with BMX. So it's quite interesting to see like how everyone's different. Um, but yeah, I know for me, if we didn't race the last 18 months, we'd all be quite lost. Yeah. No, it is different. That's cool. I guess it's different mindsets too, like personalities of, you know, some people want to hide away and just do it and they're that good when it comes to rising to the, the occasion. They can just do it with no lead-in as well. Some people need that <clears throat> a couple races to sort of, you know, dust off the cobwebs and then go. So I guess. Yeah, for sure. I was just going to say, like, especially in road and track cycling, very much so, the the power output and all of those things now come into the, are in the sport. It's part of the sport. Your power files are so desperate. But we still have that, the difference between the person who can train really, really well and the racer. And that racing edge you all describe, it's, it's very easy to hear it in your voices about talking about the, you want to race, you need to be have that, um, pointy <laughs> elbow situation is one way I describe it to most people when we're talking about the differences of racing and, and so forth. Luke, you guys had a fantastic summer though with everything that went on in the with Tour Down Under. Um, it was actually a blessing in disguise for you guys, really, wasn't it? To be able to put yourself to the front of uh, what was a really high quality. Yeah, it's in general. quite interesting. You sort of you were speaking about the goals before, and I know for myself and quite a lot of these other boys in the Teams Pursuit team, our goals after. Tokyo are to go into the road um, so I think it was a blessing in disguise in the fact that it allowed us to focus on the road for a bit and have those goals and races to train towards which um, really kept us pushing hard and yeah it has set quite a lot of us up for after the games and we we know where we're going to go um, and it yeah I guess we've trained so hard for that trying to set up things for after the games that it kept us ticking along quite nicely and put us in a really really good spot for the track coming up because we just got so fit doing that road. Um, and it sort of changed our whole prep to what we had originally planned 18 months ago where it was going to be mix in road and track. Um, but for this prep, we did, what, four or five months of all road, and now we've done, now we're going to be doing two, three months of just track um, and really focusing on the speed because we've got all that road and base behind us. So I think for us, it really has been a blessing in disguise with how it's worked. Um, and, yeah, we're just lucky to have all the, all the racing because, yeah, I sort of believe that you've either got it or you don't, like if you need to have that racing mindset to be able to, to be able to win and get there, like the hardest trainers are the ones that'll, that'll win it on the day if you've got it. But if you don't have that racing mindset either, it doesn't matter how hard you train it as well. I think like you, you need to have that edge to, to be able to win at the Olympics. Um, <laughs> yeah. hey. I'm so sorry. Your dog agrees. <laughs> the racing puppy. mindset. <laughs> the puppy concurs. Um, yeah, there's, there's only so many crossing sprints you can do out on the road around Adelaide, isn't there? Yeah. Before you have to get the number on. So. Uh, Laurie, I just wanted to ask, the American BMX racing scene, like, now you'll have to all go and Google this because you're so much younger than I am. Back in the day when BMX started, all right, before you were all born, there was a guy called Stompin' Stu Thompson who raced for Mongoose and he was the legend of BMX worldwide. My question is, how is the how is the scene in America? Is it still rock solid? Is it still got the depth to it? Um, it doesn't have the pro depth, but it has the amateur and the kid depth, which I guess is just as important. So uh, it definitely doesn't have the the sponsorship money and the support that it used to. Um, the prize money has probably dropped off a little bit. You can kind of argue it both ways. Most people would actually say that the Olympics ruined that side of it. 
because it, it brought, um, it, it took away like the, the, the BMX casual, you just, you love what you do, you just ride every day, it's not serious, um, you know, like you don't train, like, it, you know, but now with the Olympics, it's, that has that like serious professional side, there's, you know, national federations backing things and creating programs and you're either in the program or out of the program and it just causes issues, um, or it has, I guess, especially in the US and then, um, yeah, it's just kind of created a little bit of a sour taste, but in saying that, it's still very, very strong. Um, they have, you know, very big events. The kids are, like, the, the numbers are, are high. Um, so it's, you know, it's still the place to be for it. But back when Stu was around, it's probably a little different. <laughs> and and Lauren, did you, um, would you say that you're the the casual kind of BMXer or has it changed over time or are you still that you um, know, casual kind of rider? I I was that's definitely how it started like I was yeah. major tomboy I like it was <laughs> dirt jump skate parks kind of like you know until it was dark I wouldn't come home um, but then you know I definitely got introduced to the serious stuff like at a fairly I would say uh, maybe like well it's probably not that young 13, 14 is when I probably started to train. Um, and then I was on the national team at 17. So, um, I, I, but I went all in. So I got very serious and I would probably say maybe too much. Um, like I could have probably left, you know, yeah, just carried on like living at home and just sort of doing that route for a bit longer. Um, I, I could, I could argue both sides of it. So, but then as time's gone on, I've kind of, I'm, I'm still all in and serious, but I definitely um, try to find like the old me, if that makes sense, a little bit more mm -hmm. like in day to day and just find the enjoyment. But now I, I find so much enjoyment in training, like the day to day, the small successes, like if yeah. I can just get that hundreds of, a, you know, the tiniest little bit, I'm, I'm over the moon. I'll have a beer at night. I'll be so stoked. <laughs> so, nice. Yeah. Luke, we talk about uh, the development of a sport. It's, it's a little bit hard to talk to you about development because you're so young still, mate, and I'm sorry to drop that on you. But <laughs> coming from the Brunswick Cycling Club, you've come through with a number of very good NRS teams and so forth. Um, you gave me one of the funniest grabs I've ever had doing this job over the years at the Tour of Tropics. I don't know if you remember this before the stage that you actually ended up won by a tyre's width. And it was pouring with rain. We were both standing there absolutely soaking wet. And all of a sudden, you just came to me and smiled and said, I hate bike racing. <laughs> <laughs> do you remember that? I do remember that race. Um, yeah. <laughs> it was pretty grim weather that day, wasn't it? Oh, it was horrible. Um, no, it was quite interesting. Just hearing Lauren talk as well. I think for us boys, um, we've had Anthony Dean training with us quite a lot in Adelaide recently. So... I didn't really know a whole lot about BMX um, before the last 18 months, I guess. So for me, having Anthony in the gym with us, we've, yeah, we sort of, I guess, we've adopted him into our men's track endurance group um, for the last for the last little bit in the gym. Um, so it's, I guess we've all enjoyed having a new face around, but we've also learned so much about it. And I think I'm, I'm always blown away by the sprinters and how much they lift in the gym, but also to see how strong Anthony is, is pretty, pretty amazing. Um, so for me, it's, I'm really looking forward to watching you as well, Lauren and Anthony, um, at the games. It's sort of given me a new appreciation to BMX um, and learning so much about it. So it's kind of cool how I think all the pods and all the programs have started to combine. I think I've heard previously that yeah, it's always used to be a bit different and they're a bit more separated. But for the last two years, I've really seen how close knit it is. And to now have the BMX as part of it as well has been really awesome. Ah, it's awesome. Good to hear. Carly, I don't want to touch on a, a, what might be a, a sad subject. Okay. I'll just prepare you for the question. <laughs> right. Four, four times, it's not that bad, four times world team sprint champion, mm -hmm. three with Anna Mears, one with Steph Morton, and we're not doing the team sprint this time. You're going in as an individual, our sprinter and our Kieran rider, and there's no 500-metre time trial, which you are the queen of Australian cycling at with Com Games and so forth most recently. Going in, it's just about Carly. Mm. How much of a difference is that for you this time? 
it's such a weird thing because one of the reasons why I fell in love with sprint cycling was I loved the individual nature of it and that, you know, you go out there and it's all about you. Like you can't blame anybody else. So it's ironic then that my most success has come through the team sprint. Um, however, having said that, I think the team sprint, unlike say a team's pursuit is there's still a high degree of individual competency required in that, in that event. So I've been very fortunate that my teammates have been the best in the world. And, and, you know, likewise, I've been pretty good too. So we were a formidable combinations when we did team up. The team sprint was my dream for Tokyo. Um, it took me quite some time to come to grips with the fact that, you know, I don't want to like be too cocky or anything, but I really believe that Steph and I were going to, you know, win, if not get a medal. So um, now having to focus particularly on the Kieran, which, you know, the Kieran is like BMX in, in some regards, you know, you can have a crash, it's, you know, you, you draw poorly and, you know, that can sort of throw out your whole race. And so you, you all of a sudden go into this event that's a lot less controlled and um, and it's very much, you know, no, I wouldn't say um, a lucky dip, but it's definitely, you know, not as clean cut as a team sprint where it's just a race against the clock. So it's been different for me on a multitude of factors. You know, I am i don't have that teammate beside me anymore. Um, it, it is just me in the, in the, as the only female in the, in the sprint group at the moment. So I've really welcomed having the, the endurance group back up and having the women's truck endurance there. Um, and so, yeah, having to focus on the Kieran and, and make it all just about me has been um, quite interesting because a lot of my last 10 to 12 years has been about the team sprint only. And, you know, all of a sudden now it's about me and what can I do in the Kieran and the sprint. So it's definitely um, quite different. Very much so. Very much so. I'm really looking forward to seeing you, like I said before, be up on that podium moving forward. Now, you've all, you two have been to three Olympics. This is going to be a, have a very different feel to it, this one. No crowds, and there's going to be a lot of waiting in line to get into venues and so forth with COVID restrictions and so forth. What advice can you give the young buck in the middle of our screen here about <laughs> what to expect? And that's not to say you're both old either, because I'm a lot older than both of <laughs> you. Okay, I don't want to put it that way. Oh, not at all. Um, what advice can you give Luke Platt? moving into his first Olympics? I'd probably actually flip it back onto Luke because, you know, I really enjoy having Luke around. He's always smiling. He's always pretty easygoing. So I think having a little bit of that, um, you know, joker style is probably what we're going to need when we are waiting in long lines and, you know, having to have daily COVID tests and those sorts of things. I'm sure Luke will keep it very light. You're not the class clown, are you, Luke? <laughs> Oh, I like to have a bit of fun, keep it, keep it enjoyable. <laughs> <laughs> so we're on the start line in Tokyo. What are the memories of you getting into cycling? Carly, I, I know I've heard you told me your story. I've heard your story so many times about Phil Bates getting you onto a bike and then the family supporting you so much. Um, Luke, you come from Brunswick Cycling Club. We saw a magnificent photo recently in social media of you and Segregante doing a, a Madison together. And Lauren, <laughs> coming from Bunbury and now living in San Diego, you can all take this question on. Um, what do you look back on over your career to this point when you're lining up on the start line at Olympic Games? Who are the people in the back of your mind that uh, come to the forefront of your thoughts? Well, I'll go first. I mean, I think um, there's just too, probably too many to actually like identify. I would be talking for the rest of this podcast. Um, but I think um, for me, I, I think the people who got me onto the bike because I thought cycling was a bit lame, which I definitely <laughs> see now that it definitely wasn't, lame. isn't. I love cycling. Yeah. And in those hard days, and I've had some hard days over the last 12 months, I've had to remember that girl that got on that bike one summer afternoon in 2005 and just fell in love with cycling. And, um, you know, I'm very fortunate that, um, you know, with sprinting, we do a lot of fun training, chasing motorbikes, going fast. I get to have a taste of that every day. And so like Lauren, I've just tried to really focus on um, enjoying those small gains, those small wins, those small opportunities that, 
um, when you're at, you know, when you're 15 years deep into your career, you, you're not looking for tenths of seconds, you're looking for hundreds of seconds to improve. So, um, yeah, I think when I'm on the start line, I'll just be thinking back to, you know, where I was when I was 17, when I first found a bike and, and thinking to myself, wow, you know, I made that dream come true. And yeah, 17, wow. I was a little bit older. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. And, um, yeah, hopefully, hopefully I can take the dream to that next level, which is obviously that gold medal. So um, that, that would be the pinnacle. Not to embarrass Carly and jump in on your two answers, but 17 and within two years, standing on the podium at the Junior World. So fairly easy to see that cycling was the, the right choice. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't as lame as I thought. Yeah. <laughs> Massive. Yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. Well, I'll go next. My, I think the biggest thing is just my childhood. That's um, definitely like what would light up my face when I think about BMX and um, just, yeah, totally how it started. My brother and just like our neighborhood friends, um, before I had even like gone to the BMX track, we would just, we had a group that were just best friends and they were by far the best days of my life. And that's how it started. And, um, yeah, that's how I got into it with that. No, there was no serious, it was total fun. It was just what you do. Um, the Olympics was not even a question. It didn't even exist at the time. Um, so that's, yeah, I think if I was to sit back on the starting hill and look at the last three Olympic cycles and then what, what was before that. Really that were around. Um, and then the Bunbury BMX Club, which is where it kind of all started, but there's that early days and then this last kind of three years with um, my coach Sam, training partner Elise, I think that's, um, yeah, the two, from where it started to where it's kind of somewhat ending, maybe ending, maybe not, um, would be like, they're the best days of my life with BMX for sure. Uh, Lauren, Bunbury, country coastal town, do you really see that as a big advantage to how your life has gone with this sport? Because... I'm not saying Bunbury's certainly not a small city, but there's back when you were 13, there was less to do in a lot of respects. There was no hours and hours of Netflix and so forth to play around with. No, definitely not. I'm just plugging my my laptop in. Um, I grew up like fishing, um, surfing, um, yeah. like I would go um, snorkeling, diving. Um, dirt jumps, like that's how I grew up. Um, I probably went fishing every day. So, but I think that's what's made it like even better um, or more special. Just, I'm a family girl. I have moved away from home, but um, I've had their backing from day one. Um, and yeah, I kind of went from that to then just traveling the world like and solo because we kind of do everything by ourselves. You only have like a small kind of crew. Um, so yeah, it's one extreme to the other, but I certainly can't wait to get back there and have lived that really low key lifestyle again. And Luke, what are the memories that are going to start coming back towards you as you move forward? When you're standing in line waiting for COVID test number seven to get into the velodrome, <laughs> where are you going to put your mind to uh, just settle the nerves and, and enjoy the moment? Uh, I, yeah, I think for me it's quite interesting because it's all happened really quick since the start of 2018. Um, I remember I was real keen to, to go to the road and just start start life in Europe and, and try to become a road rider um, at the start of 2018 and I was pretty much committed to going and Tim basically tapped me on the shoulder and said, hey mate, I don't, don't think you should go, um, I really think you should do the track and for me that's sort of how it started because I was, I was off, I was done, I was going to the road and never doing track again. Um, he sort of pulled me aside and said, give it one last crack. Um, and since then, Junior Worlds then moved straight to Adelaide and, and since then it's just really flowed on. So I haven't had a lot of time to reflect on it. Um, but I think for, for me, it was Tim telling me, hey, I think you should come to Adelaide and give it one last crack. That's sort of something that I'm really thankful for. Uh, and it has, has really gone on since then. But like you said, at Brunswick, that was sort of where the, where the dream did start. Um, I grew up and, and rode with so many people that I had so much success over there uh and that's that's where the the love came from it um yeah but i think for me it'll be i'll be reflecting on two years ago when or three years ago now when tim said give it a crack and 
and since then it really has flowed on and I think I can't it's it's hard to reflect because it has happened so fast um so yeah I think I'll have to wait till we're in hotel quarantine and got the two weeks off after the Olympics to <laughs> to really look back on it all so last year, Luke, you and I did a, a couple of uh, chats with uh, junior development coaching seminars and so forth. One of the things that came through the screen at me then was there was a lot of under-17s and early under-19s, uh, first year under-19s in those talks, a lot of Victorian guys in there, and they knew you like best mates. Like There's a real um, community feel to a group of kids over the last 10 years or more coming out of Victoria who are the people behind that? Who are the secrets to that foundation with the state teams and so forth? Yeah, oh, to be honest, a lot of it's all Brunswick. They they develop that culture. Um, and now a lot of them have moved into, or the coaches at Brunswick have moved into higher roles because they created so much there that, like Vanessa Boss now, the coach of the VIS, and moved on through there. And I think it's just bringing the culture, uh, not just through Brunswick now, but through Victoria. Um, and I think that's what made it so special to be able to go out and train and ride with all your mates. And yeah, like you said, I always look forward to going back home because I get to go to Brunswick and, and train hard, but I get to catch up with all my mates um, and keep in contact with them. So I think Cam and Dave uh, from Brunswick are who taught me to, to love it and have fun. Um, my favourite training sessions are chasing Cam's posty bike uh, along the Great Ocean Road. So I think that's something that I'll always hold on to and probably my favourite session I'll ever I'll ever do so yeah it's just the Brunswick culture and the Victorian culture now that it's created um, I love and we've seen a few more Victorians join the program here in Adelaide now um, and it's good to bring that culture over to Adelaide we're going to finish up very shortly Carly you come from St George Cycling Club uh, I had the absolute humbling pleasure to host the uh, centennial dinner in 2020 the history of that club and so forth if you're, I'm going to get ready for this question, the other two of you, because Carly's going to hit with it on the spot. What is the legacy that Carly McCulloch wants to be able to leave behind when she decides to, say, not put the number on anymore? I think um, I've got a really similar story to, to Lauren, so I hope I don't steal your thunder, Lauren. Yeah, but go for it. <laughs> I don't think that I'm the most talented athlete out there. I have talent because I wouldn't be able to get to where I am today without talent, but I think my qualities of hard working, persistence, my resilience, my dedication, um, all the things that go on behind the scenes that people don't really see day to day or you know, they don't see when you're standing on top of the podium. They're the things that have made me who I am today. And I think that if there was anything that I hope to leave behind to any kid coming through is that you don't have to be the most talented you just have to you know work hard be persistent and you know keep grinding away quietly and eventually you will reach whatever your maximum potential is whether that's a you know a pb at a club race or that is getting onto an olympic team you should be super proud of that and um you know as long as you can go out there and give your best that's all that really matters very good Luke, I'm going to bypass that question on you. You're too young to think about a legacy. Lauren, <laughs> what do you, what, how do you want to be remembered within the sport? Yeah, I feel like um, maybe that's still to come. Like the, I'll be able to answer that, you know, sort of in the future because I, I feel like I haven't quite finished what I've set out to do. Excellent. Um, so, but I'm working on it, and I think just my whole experience of find something that you enjoy and just be really good at it. Um, and find the small things in life. So I've always enjoyed simple things. Um, I've always been somewhat to myself. So just find who you are and what you enjoy and create a good environment with good people around you and then just do that and do it really well. Um, and that's, that's what I've enjoyed. So I would just recommend and encourage people to kind of do the same if that's the same personality they are. Um, nothing... Uh, nothing definitely comes easy. I I want to say I had talent as a kid. Um, I just did. I played like all different sports, and I I was never amazing, but I was fairly good. I think I was gifted, but I hit. I, I got to that point where um, you had to. I had to pick a sport, and then I had to. I got beaten, and it kind of then you had to kind of start all over and realize it's okay. Now this is when the hard work comes in, and all the natural stuff goes away. Because once you get to that point, everybody's good. So I went through it all and then just 
worked out yeah the hard work and and the dedication and commitment so um i would say i'm a committed person and so if i set out to do something um i, I will continue until i get it um and I, I would just say that for everything in life not just sport or you know career just family friends if you're going to commit to something commit and do it you'll be so much happier at the end no matter the outcome like even if you don't go and win a gold medal but if you give it your all, which is what I felt I've done in this particular Olympic cycle, I already, before even I get on the plane, I already feel so like completed, if that makes sense. So, yeah, it totally makes sense. Well, yeah, kind of, yeah. Like, it's all, the stars are lining up for you because uh, Aus Cycling's kicked off since November last year. And uh, I've been dealing with the Bunbury BMX Club uh, this last few months because they're running the state championships this year. So... Uh, Nice. Lauren Reynolds' awesome. name has been popping up a fair bit. I have to say a very big thank you to all three of you for coming together. I'm in WA, two of you are in Brisbane, one of you is in San Diego. Uh, well done to the Aus Cycling uh, comms team to be able to put this together and get to speak to you all. I wish you, you absolutely all the best, and no matter what happens when you're on the track, yes, there's pressure to win, but be aware there's a, there's a nation behind you cheering you. They're not expecting anything from you other than being the best you can be for yourself. So you've got a lot of fans out there. I wish you all the best. And I really thank you for your time today. Thanks, thank Matt. You so Thanks, Matt. See Good you luck. Later. Carly and Luke Cheers. as well. I'll see you yeah. over there. Good luck, Lauren. Thank you. See you there.